can do during the event is um, if she says something, you get really excited and you want to show her that you're excited, you can clap at the camera and then she'll be able to see that. So <laughs> keep that in mind too. All right. So my name is Caitlin Shea. I'm the events and media director. I realized a few weeks ago, I stopped saying who I was because I just see so many familiar faces each week. But I was like, there's also new people and they might not know. Um, so I do the events and media for Walt Women Birthplace. And we're so excited to have Christina with us once again. She's our uh, Walt Women Birthplace Long Island Poet of the Year. And she's been doing so much for us. You have no idea. She's actually the person who suggested that we go online with our events right after the quarantine started. So we just feel so lucky. She sort of got us started in the right direction and then we can welcome her back now. And we're more organized on our end, certainly, than that first time. <laughs> I'm sure she's noticed too. Um, but I always wanna start the events by saying thank you so much to everyone who donates. Some of you donate every week, um, but even $5, like a cup of Starbucks, any amount is more than just money to us. It's also a way for us to start working on getting funding for grants that will help us continue these programs in the future. So we wanna show that contemporary poets' voices um, have a place, they should have a stage, um, and that people wanna to come to these events. But even if you can't donate right now, being here today also does so much for us. Um, we've been growing a lot with our audience, especially online, because people can tune in from so many different places. And those numbers also help us show people wanna see this and be a part of it. So thank you so much for that, everyone who's here, everyone who continues to be here, um, and we have a lot of events coming up. We just added some new ones. So I'm gonna very briefly go through that. Um, every week I say, we have one event a week on Zoom, but the next two weeks we have two events <laughs> um, each week on Zoom. So I'm just gonna tell you really quick, a little overview. I'm gonna post links in the chat. So don't memorize any of this, just get a grand feeling for what's to come very soon. All right, so next week on the 25th, which is Thursday, we have James Wagner joining us, and he is the U.S. Beat Poet Laureate for 2020 and 2021, and he's going to talk to us about Japanese poetry, which is awesome, um, and he's also going to be talking about an anthology that he wants people to submit to, um, and he's going to give more details on that, so that should be interesting, especially if you're a poet and you want to submit. Um, then we have an open mic on Friday the 26th. Um, we had one last week and it went amazing. Um, people from the audience can share their poetry too. So if you're interested in that, please join us. Then on Friday the 3rd, so the day before 4th of July, we have uh, Walking with Whitman, which is one of our programs that we've had actually for 10 years. Um, and we'll have Octavio Quintanilla with us. And we'll have Wayne Manecki, who is here tonight. I saw you before, Wayne. So we're gonna have that plus music, live music with, um, uh, with Rory, who she's an amazing local uh, musician. So definitely tune in for that. She's, she does this music where she has two microphones going at once and she has one with a recording and one where she's singing live. So it sort of comes together. Very cool, so you gotta check that out. Um, and then the following week, we, or sorry, that same week, on Sunday the 5th, we have um, Jane's Hill, which is nearby the birthplace. It's the highest point on Long Island, and you can hike up there. And uh, Andrew Rimby will be with us. He's a Whitman expert. He's getting his PhD and has a lot to do with Whitman. He's going to be t giving us a tour of Jane's Hill, and he's going to be reading Whitman uh, while he gives the tour. It's going to be on Zoom. so. If you've never visited Long Island, if you can't come to the museum, this is a great way to see the area as well and walk in Whitman's footsteps, literally. So that's exciting. We just added that and it's the day after 4th of July. All right. So got that out of the way. You have a little idea of what's to come and then you can always click those links and get all the specific information later on. And then just really quick, I wanted to talk about how uh, the painter Van Gogh was actually connected to Whitman. Um, Van Gogh was very inspired by Whitman 
And I'm going to read you a little bit of a letter that he wrote to his sister. And it was right around the time that he painted Starry Night, his most famous painting. And you can see that he's very uh, influenced by in the, particularly Starry Night, but probably in general in that time period of his life. So he writes to his sister, Wilhelmina, have you read the American poems by Whitman? I am sure Teo has them. Teo is his brother who owns an art gallery. And I strongly advise you to read them because to begin with, they are really fine and the English speak about them a good deal. He sees in the future and even in the present, a world of healthy, carnal love, strong and frank of friendship, of work, under the great starlit vault of heaven, something which one can only call God, an eternity in its place above the world. At first, it makes you smile. It is also candid and pure, but it sets you thinking for the same reason. The Prayer of Columbus, a poem by Whitman, is very beautiful too. So that just sort of puts in perspective, he, he definitely was reading Whitman. It was definitely floating around in his mind when he's making these paintings. Um, and a lot of people have commented that the way the paintings sort of look like they're all, everything's connected to stars, the sky, everything sort of mirror images each other and comes together is also influenced by Whitman. When Whitman talks about we're all made of atoms and we're all connected in that way. So it's just a beautiful connection there. Um, and I also want to suggest a book that's the letters of uh, Van Gogh to his brother, Teo. They're beautiful letters. They give you such a good idea of that time period and also Van Gogh's struggle throughout his life. You know, he didn't sell many paintings. He had no idea that we'd be talking about him here today at all. So just that perspective on his life is amazing. Okay, without further ado, we're gonna talk more about paintings, more about poetry right now with Christina. And thank you so much again, Christina, for being here. Awesome, thank you. Yeah, that was fascinating. We were chatting a little bit at, um, before this started about all the connections that Whitman has. And I, I brought up the, the idea that I do that. I, I don't listen to Bob Dylan a lot, but the other day I was listening to a Dylan song and it was like, I can paint your I was like, that is Whitman. So Whitman is everywhere. Um, in the chat, I actually, I uploaded two different files. They're the same files. One's a PDF and one is um, a Word doc. They're of the poems that I'm talking about today. So if you want to take a look at them, open them on your own computer, you can do that. I'm going to share my screen uh, so we can talk a little bit about acrostic poetry. And um, if you don't know what acrostic poetry is, acrostic uh, comes from a Greek word. Don't ask me what it means. I don't remember. But um, we can look it up. And it's about, it's poetry that is about uh, art. Usually we think of it as poetry, as visual art. Um, and today we're going to talk about acrasis in two different schools. So we're going to talk about it as in old school and new school, like the more modern. So in old school acrasis, it was about art, but also it could be about like a valiant sword or a shield in battle. And uh, because shields and swords way back when were very ornate. And so they were artistic in some ways. And old school Acrasis describes in a lot of detail and uh, it moves in spatial. So top to bottom, bottom to top. Um, and it doesn't go really beyond the piece of work. Whereas in modern Acrasis, in this new school, uh, it will talk about the work the piece of art. And in new school, it's usually a painting, more visual art. It's no longer like um, ornate um, battle instruments. Uh, so it's more of artwork in the modern times. And it will talk about it in some detail sometimes, but also it'll go beyond. It'll make connections. Sometimes it embodies the artwork. Uh, sometimes it makes connections with like the, the world out there and bigger ideas. And so we're going to take a look at some examples. And so I am going to hopefully share. Oh, I can't share my screen, Caitlin. Yeah. How do we get it from the chat? Is that is that www Dropbox, et cetera? Is that how to get it from there? The, yeah, in the chat, there are two files if you scroll up. And also, there are links. If you copy the link and paste it into your browser, you can open it that way. 
or open the file where it says Word and then open the file with the yes. other one, whatever, yeah. whatever that might be. Okay. And so. try it again, Kristen. Oh, okay, I can share it now. Yeah. You Thank can. you. Okay, okay. So here we go. I am sharing. There we go. Yeah, there we go. So you should be seeing a, a poem called The Dance on your screen. And let me move move everybody's faces up there. That's fantastic. Okay, so this is called The Dance. It's by William Carlos Williams. William Carlos Williams was also part of a movement called the Imagist Movement. And the Imagists believe that uh, you, you don't have to explain or narrate, you just say the words in very vivid ways. And so here he's taking his Imagistic style and making an acrostic poem. And it is called The Dance. And I do pronounce this as Bruchel, but I am probably wrong. So if anybody knows how to pronounce that, feel free to correct me. Um, I say it differently every time, and that's how I'm saying it today. So let's take a look. The dance. In Bruchel's great picture, the Kermesse, the dancers go round. They go round and around. The squeal and the blare and the tweedle of bagpipes, a bugle and fiddles tipping their bellies round as the thick-sided glasses whose wash they impound, their hips and their bellies off balance to turn them, kicking and rolling about the fairgrounds, swinging their butts, those shanks must be sound to bear up under such rollicking measures, trance as they dance in Bruegel's great picture, the Kermesse. <laughs> I am gonna show it to you, I will show it to you, but before we even do that, and some of you are probably familiar with the, with the painting, but before we do that, we can think about how this, this poem uses uh, the very specific details of sensory image. And so it tells us that there are dancers and the way that they move. So it brings movement to the painting and the poem, even though both the painting and the poem are actually static. And then it appeals, since it's a dance, it appeals to our, our sense of hearing because it talks about the squeal and the blare and the tweedle of bagpipes. Tweedle is such a great word, right? Um, and then it mentions the bugle and the fiddles. Okay? And then it brings more movement with the kicking and the rolling and the swinging. And the word butts is very unexpected. I would not expect that from William Carlos Williams, but there it is. And then, uh, he, and then what he does is because, because the, the dance goes around in a circle, the poem then goes around in a circle and it ends where it begins with that same line. Okay, so uh, I'm gonna scroll down really quick. So if you tend to get dizzy, maybe close your eyes for a moment. I'm gonna scroll down and take a look at what the picture is. Um, oh wait, that was it. Sorry, everybody, there we go. So there are people going round and round, and the, everybody's kind of round in a way. So he brings the poem, to, he brings the painting to life. Okay. Then we have, W.H. Auden's um, Musée des Beaux-Arts. And so this, this, this poem is a little, um, is interesting because it does use um, old school and it also kind of shifts into new school a little bit in reverse. So it has two stanzas and it acts as a hinge poem. So they're about the same length, the stanzas. And what happens is it zooms in. It starts talking about the museum as a whole. So we have this wider setting. And then it zooms in on one of the paintings in the museum and it gets a little bit more acrostic there. So let's take a look at this poem. About suffering, they were never wrong the old masters, how well they understood its human position, how it takes place while someone else is eating or opening a window or just walking dully along, how when the aged are reverently, passionately waiting for the miraculous birth, there always must be children who do not specially want it to happen, skating on a pond at the edge of the wood. They never forgot that even the dreadful martyrdom must run its course anyhow in a corner some untidy spot where the dogs go on with their doggy life and the torturer's horse scratches its innocence behind on a tree. In Bruegel's Icarus, for instance, how everything turns away quite leisurely from the disaster. 
The plowman may have heard the splash, the forsaken cry, but for him, it was not an important failure. The sun shone as it had on the white legs disappearing into the green water and the expensive delicate ship that must have seen something amazing. A boy falling out of the sky had somewhere to get to and sailed calmly on. So we have these connections, like these overarching connections about what the masters are thinking and what they're doing. And then we zone in, we zoom in on this, um, this painting of Icarus. And it talks specifically about parts of the painting and the intricacies of the, of the, um, the white legs disappearing into the green water um, and how everything seems to be turning away from the disaster. And so it's talking about space, but also it's embodying what some of the characters might be thinking or what might be going on, which is a new school idea a little bit before new school time. So when we have uh, the idea that the ship must have seen something, but it had somewhere to get to and calmly sailed on, that's thinking beyond the painting. It's letting the poem uh, in, um, kind of take over on that ship and thinking about what that ship would be doing and, and feeling. So if we take a look at that, uh, that painting. Okay, this is the fall of Icarus, this is the painting. And so we have the plowman and then we have the ships in the background and, um, oh, where's Icarus? This is not a good portrait of it. Um, there he is. Okay, there are legs going into the green, yeah. Um, if you go on to, uh, well, if you just go on to the Google and Google them, you'll find many, many different renditions of these that are a, a little bit better. I tried to get ones that are bright, but my screen is not very bright. Um, but you can see that he takes, he takes the idea of the green, he talks about the plowman, he talks about how all of these other people are kind of looking away from the very bottom of the, of the painting um, and how the ships, they must see something, but they're just sailing away. They have someplace to get to. So he's embodying some of the, the, the characters in the poem as well. Um, it's just a pretty poem and it's a sad poem. And the painting isn't really um, an upbeat painting. It has like kind of a, a darker hue to it. Uh, so whereas the, the dance has a lot of movement, this doesn't really have a lot of movement. It has a lot of static notions and the painting is rather static. It's about this person that has fallen into the water and just their legs are showing. Okay, the next one I have for you is called, it's a little bit long, you can see how long it is. It's two paintings by Gustav Klimt and it's by Jory Graham. And it's about two different paintings. One's a finished painting and one isn't a finished painting. And it's, it seems very long, but you can see that the, the, um, this, the line length is very short. And there's a reason that the line length is short and that the stanzas are set up this way. And once we figure out what the poems are about, you'll see why, why there's um, these very skinny columns of a poem here. So let's, let's read two, uh, two paintings by Gustav Klimt. Although what glitters on the trees, row after perfect row, is merely the injustice of the world. The chips on the bark of each beech tree catching the light. The sum of these delays is the beautiful, the human beautiful body of flaws. The dead would give, would give anything, I'm sure, to step again onto the leaf rot, into the avenue of mottled shadows, the speckled broken skins, the dead in their sheer open parenthesis, what they wouldn't give for something to lean on that won't give way. I think I would weep for the moral nature of this world, for the right and wrong like pools of shadow and light you can step in and out of, crossing this yellow beech forest, this book involved. One autumn afternoon, late in the 20th century, in hollow light, the gaseous light, to receive the light and return it, and stand in rows, anonymous, is a sweet secret even the air wishes it could unlock. See how it pokes at them in little hooks, the blue air, the yellow trees. Why be afraid? They say when Klimt died suddenly, a painting still incomplete was found in his studio, a woman's body open 
at its point of entry rendered in graphic pornographic detail. Something like a scream between her legs, slowly feathery, he had begun to paint a delicate garment, his trademark over this mouth of her body. The mouth of her face is genteel, bored, feigning a need for sleep. The fabric defines the surface, the story, so we are drawn to it. It's blues and yellows glittering like a stand of beech trees late one afternoon in Germany in fall. It is called Buchenwald, it is 1890. In the finished painting, the argument has something to do with pleasure. I'm gonna scroll down real quick and I'm gonna show you the first painting that she's talking about and then we'll talk about the structure of the poem and it will probably be clear why. So this is the, uh, the painting that she's talking about uh, with the trees and the glittering. And again, this isn't the best rendering of this painting, but um, in a brighter, on a brighter screen or the painting in a brighter tone, it seems to glitter. And there are places in the painting where it seems to glitter with light. And we see all of these trees that are very tall and long and skinny. And if you think about the structure of the poem itself, it's a very tall and long and skinny poem. And so here we have the structure kind of mimicking what it's talking about in the poem. Uh, however, uh, although it does talk about the glittering of the forest and it talks about all the different trees, it goes more beyond the painting, which is like that new school, more modern idea that um, we make connections from just describing the painting and move beyond that. So here, She's talking about this lovely, this lovely painting of this lovely forest. Um, but she immediately uh, turns from that into the injustice of the world and talks about how the dead would enjoy coming back just to walk in the leaf rot and the mottled shadows in this forest. So there are two things going on here. And then she gets to the second painting My Adobe reader just gave up on me. There we go. Uh, then she gets to the second painting by um, tying in the idea of Clint's death. So she's talking about the dead, and then she talks about Clint suddenly dying and leaving this incomplete painting and what he would be doing the next step with the painting as it is now. And so instead of embodying the first painting, now she's embodying the artist and what he would have been doing based on what we know about his style. Um, so she's got a lot of things going on in the poem by combining the two, uh, the two paintings together in the one poem. And so I will show you the, the, second, po the second painting as well. Um, so this is the first one. And then this is the second one that is unfinished, that it has some stuff going on so far, but it is not finished yet. The, the, the second painting that he's referring to, that she is referring to in, in the poem is called The Bride. So if, again, if you want to look that up, you can, you can find this. And it's incomplete uh, because he died in the middle of, of trying to complete the painting. Um, and then, okay. So then, so we can see in this one, in, in, in the dance, what we had was the mimicking of the movement and the idea of being round. And the poem isn't round, but the poem's structure goes in a cycle and it begins and ends in the same way. In Jory Graham's poem, the structure mimics the, the idea of those long, tall trees lining up by having those very short lines in a row. And in making some lines indented and some not, there is a clear middle through all of that, which you wouldn't get if it was justified, if all of the lines were justified over just on the left, it would be much more jagged on the other side and it would be very unbalanced. But here we have a middle through as a tree would stand really, really tall. Uh, so the, the style here is mimicking those trees in, the, in, the first, um, in that first painting. Okay. Um, and there's, there's a whole lot more to talk about. So I'm gonna go through all of these and then we can open it up to chat and, and see what your thoughts are. Um, so the last one I have is a poem I actually wrote Um, if I can find it, there we go, okay. Um, and it's after Kandinsky's Flood Improvisation. So inside a Kandinsky mind, 
uh, and then you can, this is, um, it's a little bit old school because it is describing, um, but it's trying, it's using that description to interpret what's on, uh, what's on, what's in the painting. And once you see the painting, you'll see why we have to interpret it. Uh, so inside a Kandinsky mind. There's a cat in there with a naked red robotic eye. He screeches out of a blackened throat beside a crooked human pelvic bone tossed away to a corner, useless and unthrusted. And above that, a Mardi Gras confetti waterfall of magenta against white gray. A bottle of champagne shoots its cork south from puckered chrome lips, leaving a blue-pink trail in its wake beside a toucan beak and a baboon's tail who scowl next to the unhatchable egg. So we have that, which probably makes no sense to you. But then when we look at the painting, well, there it is. So it's a, it's a painting that's quite abstract. And so this is a fun thing that I do with my classes. I'm like, find the things I wrote about in the poem because everybody kind of seems something a little bit different. And when we're talking about space here, the poem itself starts with that cat, the ro red robotic eye. So this is the eye, and then these are the whiskers. And then it talks about um, a pelvic bone, which is over here. And it talks about a champagne and chrome lips. So that's the champagne bottle and the champagne shooting. Okay. So there's a lot of things going on here that I have interpreted from the poem. So I'm describing, I'm interpreted from the painting. So I'm describing the painting in a spatial way and trying to say where things are. But what I'm actually what I'm actually doing is interpreting it as well. I'm going beyond the painting and saying what I think it is because there is some abstract going on here. Um, there was actually a there's a really really interesting uh, biographical um, video on YouTube about Kandinsky. If you look, you look up a Kandinsky biography on YouTube, you might be able to find it. And it talks about his style and how it changed over the years and how he has some signature elements in it. And um, to me here, the signature element is the circles and the round circles, the roundness of all of the, um, of, of most of the elements in here. Um, so it's an, it's an improvisation, flood improvisation. And so the poem becomes an improvisation of an improvisation. So we have kind of multiple layers there. Okay, so those are the four poems that I had wished to share with everybody. So we're getting an idea of what a crassus actually is. Um, and uh, before we, I start to take questions, I am going to give you an assignment that you can take and do whatever you wish with. Um, I would like you to find a piece of art that you enjoy. Um, let me, I can stop sharing. Actually, no, I'll keep it on the screen. Uh, find a piece of art that you enjoy and write an old school acrostic poem where you do not interpret and you don't make any links. And what you will do is you will describe it. Pick a way to describe it. Do you start at the center and work your way out? Do you start from the top and work your way to the bottom? Do you go across? Uh, find ways to describe it. Do you go in a circle because uh, a dance is happening? Uh, so find, some, find a piece of artwork that you really like and, and try out your old school acrasis style. And then take that same piece of art and see if you can do a new school. And there might be some crossover because new school doesn't mean that you can't describe it. Uh, but see what kind of interpretations you can make either by embodying something in the poem and speaking for it, imagining what happened right before or right after it, uh, or making connections to a larger world. So the Musée des Beaux-Arts, it zooms in and it talks about all of the old masters just in general, and then it zooms in on this one painting. So you can kind of back up from a piece of art that you've uh, chosen, and maybe it's from a particular movement or a particular time period that you would want to discuss. And, uh, and see where that takes you. You can also mimic any of these poems. Or really, if you want to mimic any of these poems, I would suggest trying to mimic um, the dance. It's a, it's a really easy structure to mimic. Uh, you have that first line and the last line that are the same. And so you can start, start there as your old school acrasis and see what happens. Uh, so, um, so I'm gonna stop talking and I invite all of you to ask questions. Uh, if there's anything that I said too quickly and you wanna go over again, or if you have any ideas of any other 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 acrostic work that uh, we could possibly find and look up, 
uh, I would be open to that, or I could just keep talking. It's all up to you, but uh, now would be a great chance for everybody to, to ask questions. Thank you, Christina, that's amazing. Yeah. Makes it sure. a nice bridge for us between visual art and poetry. It's not something that you learn in school typically is these connections. That is true. And yeah, let's start taking questions. You can type them in the chat or you can now you, well, you know, actually first let's do a round of applause. We can all unmute ourselves just for that. Oh, sure. Okay, thank you. Okay, for me too. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Jason. Thanks. Take the great poet of the year. So, oh, thanks. Yeah, Not this, this is my jam. This is fun stuff, so. Yeah, and these oh. interesting workshops we wouldn't have without her. All right, so I think yeah, I Can you that. elaborate on what you mean by a hinge poem? Seeing that, thank you for that question, Melissa. Melissa is asking if I can elaborate what I mean by a hinge poem. So let me get to the one that I called a hinge poem. Let me see that. Okay, so hinge poem, if you think about um, how what a hinge does, a, a door hinge. So you have like the middle, that's the screw, and then there's a flap on one side and a flap on the other. So in the middle of the poem, so a hinge poem will be two, um, two stanzas and the middle of the poem will be a break. And the stanzas will be about the same length. This one is a little, the, in this poem, the first one is a little bit longer than the second, but they're about the same length and they're gonna mirror each other in some way. This one uh, starts about suffering, they were never wrong, the old masters in Bruhel's Icarus. So it starts off like talking about a particular place or time or group and then it dives into something about that group. This it indicates a particular artist and painting, and then it goes deeper into the painting. So it's a general thought followed by details about that general thought. And here's another general thought followed by details of that general thought. And so the hinge poem, it hinges in this middle here so that um, the stanzas mirror each other in some way along this hinge in the middle. And that's, that's what I mean by hinge poem. This is not an exact hinge poem, but it, it's very much like it. It's very similar. Um, hinge poems are usually the same length um, with the stanzas. And that, and that can be for a crassus, but it could also be for really any, any, any kind of poem. Okay, and now Zoom is telling me that my internet connection is, is unstable, but you guys can hear me, right? Oh, sorry. All right, bless you. Uh, let's see. Acrassic poems can also be about other arts, can it? Yes, of course. Yeah, thank you, Barbara. Um, Yes, and it could be a, a poem written. Then you're getting into meta poetry, where um, those, yeah, a poem, an acrostic poem can be written about another acrostic poem. So that would be meta acrostic, I guess. Um, but yes, uh, usually we think about um, acrostic poems uh, dealing with um, a piece of art, like a painting or um, or a sculpture. But absolutely, I think that um, if we expand the idea, and I always say all art, one art, so that it does cross over. I think that if we can write a poem about a painting, about a dance, we can also write a poem about a dance. So uh, Claude McKay's uh, Harlem Dancer comes to mind, where he's describing the, the um, dancer and her outfit and the way that she sways and moves. Uh, and again, that appeals to it definitely appeals to the um, the senses in that particular poem, and uh, that's kind of like an old school of process because it, it it describes what the dance is like. Uh, so yes, I definitely acrostic can be about other other forms of art. Um, yes, Valerie Valerie is bringing up the idea that ode um, ode to Grecian urn is is an acrostic poem. Yes, it it, it definitely is. And again, that's more of the old school where it's, um, it's the idea of it's an object that it, ha it has a decorative, um, it has a decorative uh, outside, for lack of a better term. So it's an urn that is, has, uh, is, has been decorated. And um, I'm thinking of a poem that is about the Grecian urn. It's, yeah, getting back to Barbara's idea that acrostic poems can be about other acrostic poems. There is a poem that, it's an acrostic poem that references the Ode to a Grecian Urn by Keats's poem. So yes, um, so there's these levels of meta, uh, meta acrostis, but yes, Ode to a Grecian Urn, I would, it definitely, it, it talks about those lovers, you know, trying to catch each other 
and they're not going to because they're in one place static on the urn. Uh, it's, it's, it's describing all of those etchings. And yes, it's an ode, but it definitely describes, and that is a form of acrostic poetry, definitely. Um, Marna is saying, a primarily visual artist, a painting to paint. Yes, oh, I would let Marna, I wanna hear more about that. Um, if we think about also, um, if anybody's familiar with the New York School of Poetry, um, I should be writing some of this down in the chat. I'm gonna say, um, uh, New York School poet um, O'Hara. O'Hara's poem, Why I Am Not a Painter. Okay, and that actually talks about the process of writing a poem and the process of painting, which is something that we usually don't see a lot, but um, it it's uh, about, it's, well, I'm not going to get into New York School, but it is about Frank O'Hara going to his friend's studio and talking about writing a poem, but also talking about what his friend is doing um, on his uh, canvas. And then later when he sees it, it's a, a completely different painting than what he, he had seen before. And then his poem becomes a completely different poem than what he had started to write. And it's a really interesting idea of um, how the process of painting and the process of poetry um, come to be that final product. And sometimes sometimes the process is more important than that final product, as some of us know. Um, I'd like to hear more about interpreting Kandinsky. Is it hard to describe something meant to be spiritual? Um, yeah, yes. Um, I think it's hard to describe anything that is up to interpretation. And so if we, again, look at the Kandinsky, um, if we again look at the Kandinsky uh, painting, uh, this is a fun thing that I do with my students, and so now I will, I will uh, ask everybody if they want to participate. Um, so you know what I saw in this painting. I saw a cat and I saw a toucan somewhere. Um, if anybody sees anything different, like you can shout it out or you can write it in the chat, uh, what do you see in the painting and how, would, how might you approach a poem about an abstract painting? Um, it's a, let's see, Barbara Siegel sees a fish. Okay, a guitar, an eye mask. <laughs> oh, somebody else saw a mask, a bar scene, interesting, a heart, faces, but I always see faces. Yeah, that's, um, I'm gonna spell it wrong, para, para, yeah. That is not spelled right, but the idea that we see faces in everything, <laughs> if anybody knows that word, that I'm getting at. I, I usually bring that up in class and I can't remember what it's called. Um, I cannot spell it. I do it, um, but I don't know the word. I have to look it up. <laughs> okay, yeah. Um, somebody sees a pear, a woman with a mouth open and a foot and a few other things, <laughs> and a cello. Yeah, so, um, a wow, a woman with her mouth open and a foot and a few other faces. That right there is the beginning of a poem. Yeah, there you go. Someone playing an instrument, a foot, Sun, a sunflower, flowers, a tongue. So you can see that my, my poem is not about most of that. Oh, there's the foot. I see the foot now, there it is. If that's the foot, that's definitely, well, that's what I see as a foot. Um, so the underside of a bench and the apocalypse and toes. So we're all seeing different things clearly, right? So if you can, if you choose an abstract painting uh, for interpretation, I think that you can make it as difficult or as easy as, as you wish. Um, and if you are, if it is important to you what the painter wanted to convey, then that's something that you have to go back to and do research on. And sometimes I'm a lazy poet and I don't wanna do any research. So it's like my first, my first instinct um, and, and what I see. The name of this painting is Flood Improvisation. Yeah, Flood, wait, it's, there's a number to it. Hang on, uh, let me go back up. Flood, it, nope, nope, flood improvisation. That's, that's this painting, yeah. Uh, and if you just look up Kandinsky, it, his paintings, they, it's a variety, like some of them are just circles. You see a variety of circles. So his, his, um, his style changed a lot. Uh, so you can see like, if you choose an abstract painting, it's more interpretation 
even when, even when you are doing the old school because you're trying to describe it, but you're trying to make sense of it. So you can talk about shapes, you can talk about colors, but really to make a poem, it needs to be more than there's a swoosh of blue and then next to that there's a swoosh of green. Then it's just gonna be a list of things that describe, which is a good place to start, but then you wanna think about line breaks and how things go together and how to really describe that to, if nobody has ever seen the painting, how would you convey it in the poem? And I don't know if my poem about inside of Kandinsky mine actually does that. Like you read it and then you saw it and you probably didn't think, oh, that was exactly what I was thinking. Uh, so, um, but some of the other poems do do that, um, especially the old school like William Carlos Williams. Um, okay, other, other questions? Uh, we can stick with the Kandinsky or we can um, go to any of the other ones. We can go back up to the, um, the two paintings by Gustav Klimt. That has a lot in it that I didn't really touch upon yet, but if anybody wanted to go back to that one to talk about the connections, we could do that. Um, or I'll just- can I, can I make a comment or do I need to do this through chat? You can make a comment. I just, I'm not who, sure who's talking. Yeah, sure. Just say I who you are. To, I, I just wanted oh, hi, to- Hi, hello. Uh, um, just mention in reading these, I mean, poems have to stand on their own uh, as works mm -hmm. of art, separate from the, um, the painting, it's, it always struck me as a little odd that a poet would write about something that's already been done, but in a different, in a different kind of artistic <laughs> language. Um, and, and sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. The, looking at the inside of Kandinsky mind, I'm left wondering, I, I don't know who wrote this. I didn't see the name of the poet, but I'm not oh, sure. Oh, it I was me. So you can ask me directly. It was you? Okay. I'm, but yes, are, so you can ask me directly. Sure. It, it's a description, it, it describes the, the poem and it was interesting, the, the, the painting, and it was very interesting to listen to everyone have completely different ideas about what was in the painting. And so this is just, this is one version of what you see when you look at a painting and the painting speaks for itself and the poem needs to speak for itself. Um, it reminds me of that line, I don't know if you know this, probably everyone's familiar with this, Frank Zappa talked about uh, that writing about music is like dancing about architecture, that there's to some degree there is mm -hmm. impossible to express uh, a, a work of art in terms of another form of expression. Um, and, and so that's, I, I have this problem with all of ekphrastic poetry, if it's unless it has its own point to make. And, um, and I think the Auden poem does that. In fact, he doesn't get to the painting till about two thirds of the way through. And on this one, and it's mm -hmm. yours, I want to, I mean, it's, it's a lovely poem. Do I need to see the- Oh, have at it, go ahead. My students tell me that they don't like it all the time. Go ahead, yeah. yeah. Okay, so I'll, I'll stop. <laughs> no, 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 you should, you should definitely say everything. Um, I think that, it, you, no, the, the point that you're making is really, yeah, let's go back to the autumn poem, poem too. I think that the, the point that you're making is really interesting because if something exists in one medium, um, why, why try to interpret it in another and that whole idea of ekphrasis, right? And I think that if we think about like the really old school of ekphrastic where it actually came from, it wasn't the idea that it wasn't just the art, but it was this, the ornamented ornate um, objects. And a lot of that also dealt with, you know, trying to make things seem um, powerful and um, better than. So if we're describing, like it, Beowulf comes to mind, if we're describing the hilt of a sword, um, we're doing that because we want it to shine in the poem, but also we want it to show that like, this is a powerful sword and this is how he's going to vanquish his enemies. So I think that the idea, the old school idea of a process, it had, it wasn't just for entertainment, but it was also to um, show positions of power, um, to show strength, to show history. Uh, Ode on a Grecian Urn does that. And so um, as it has developed, it has become more about a painting or a sculpture, which is kind of an interesting, uh, when we think about it, it's kind of an interesting, yeah, why, why are we, you know, looking to art to make art? Um, on the flip side of that, I just, I always do that. I, I think poets steal from each other all the time anyway, so <laughs> we're just a bunch of thieves stealing lines from each other, um, songwriters stealing lines from poems, poets stealing lines from songs. I think all of that happens. 
Um, and there's some stuff going on in the chat too, so let's see what, what's happening there. Um, dancing about art would be Jackson Pollock. Oh, okay, I don't know who wrote this, because um, it says owner, but um, his methods as a dance and the poem about the movement of colors. Uh, I think, yeah, so the, that leads back to the idea of the, the idea of the process in making. And, and that being a dance, that's a very interesting idea. I have often felt that painters should not have to explain their work in words. Yeah, um, I also think that nobody should have to explain any kind of work. Um, you, can, you can leave it up to the reader or you can offer explanation, but nobody should have to explain anything. Uh, that's why, um, you know, at poetry readings, if somebody tries to explain their poem for us, I'm like, just read it. Let, let me hear it, I wanna hear the poem. And then if you wanna say anything after that, sure, go ahead, right? Uh, I don't think anybody should have to do anything. Uh, um, so I agree with that. The autonomy lies within the courage of daring to interpret something else, okay? So interpreting something else and putting your interpretation out there to see, is this right, is this wrong? Does, do people agree? Um, different art forms on the same subject experience makes a lot of sense, it offers more insight. So it does offer different perspectives for sure, everybody. Um, I believe it can stand for some animalistic yearning though, unfulfilled potential. Um, if Oh, hi, Victoria. Um, so yeah, so the, the idea that that Kandinsky mind can stand alone because it's about some yearning um, and, and sometimes it might not. Uh, and then Rosalind, visual art and poetry, Marian, acrostic poetry, I've written poems about my own paintings to express what's going on in the visual art. Yeah, that's always interesting to me when visual artists actually are also writers and they have their work in two different ways and they write about their own work um, and then making a piece of visual art based on a poem. I, I just, I, that, that for me, um, because I'm not really a visual artist. I, I mean, I like to doodle, but <laughs> there's not really much artwork going on there. Uh, so the idea that you can interpret it in the opposite way, I think is really, um, really interesting. And I do think art crosses over a lot. It, there's, um, there's a way that art leans on, leans on itself in, in different ways, uh, for sure. Um, Okay, and then yeah, I said I was gonna go back to Autumn's poem just to, to take a look that yeah, there, this idea that it does touch upon the acrasis, but only at the end, yeah. It, it leads us into it by talking about this idea in general and then narrowing down. So the idea of zooming in is also a part of that poem as well. Okay, um, other thoughts, other, other thoughts and ideas or other, other questions that you might have about um, the poems or the pieces of art that we've gone over. I'm going to also put those uh, links back in the chat, Christina, just so everyone has a chance oh, sure. to get them. But feel free to put more questions, anyone. After. Yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. Yeah, and if anybody um, has anything to say about the Jory Graham poem, I focused a lot on the structure of it. So if anybody has anything to say about anything else, anything else about that poem, feel free. I was just thinking, Christina, it's interesting that she didn't choose the more famous golden paintings. They're lesser known. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, whenever I, because I never save the, the images and I every semester I have to go back and look, look for them, um, I can never find I can never remember the bride and I can never find it. And then it takes me like forever. And I always, I always come up with a kiss and the kiss always comes up. And that's the one that all, everybody knows and it always comes up. And then um, anybody that's familiar with Klimt automatically think, think this, thinks that that's gonna be in this poem and it's not. And so I, I do think it's, it's really interesting, the ones that she has chosen. And I love that she chose something that was unfinished. And um, that, that does remind me of um, the O'Hara poem again as, the process and it starts unfinished and it becomes finished at the end. Um, actually, if anybody's interested, let me see if I can bring that poem up. Um, and then we can take a look at it. My, nope, that's not happening. Um, yeah, here it is. Okay, I'm going to share it, share my screen. There we go, here we go, and we are in it. 
And I gotta move. I'm gonna move you guys in a moment. There we go. Okay, so this is this is not ekphrastic per se, but it's got something to it. So this is O'Hara's Why I Am Not a Painter. I am not a painter, I am a poet. Why? I think I would rather be a painter, but I am not. Well, for instance, Mike Goldberg is starting a painting. I drop in. Sit down and have a drink, he says. I drink, we drink. I look up. You have sardines in it. Yes, it needed something there. Oh, I go and the days go by and I drop in again. The painting is going on and I go and the days go by. I drop in. The painting is finished. Where's sardines? All that's left is just letters. It was too much, Mike says. But me? One day I am thinking of a color, orange. I write a line about orange. Pretty soon it is a whole page of words, not lines. Then another page. There should be so much more, not of orange, of words, of how terrible orange is and life. Days go by. It is even in prose. I am a real poet. My poem is finished and I haven't mentioned orange yet. It is 12 poems. I call it oranges. And one day in a gallery, I see Mike's painting called Sardines. This is one of my favorite poems. Um, I love that it's the process and it makes so much, for, for any kind of artist, I think it really makes so much sense. And uh, I tell everybody this story about when I was writing my sabbatical application. It was like a year out from when my sabbatical actually was. And how was I gonna do that? I'm like writing about, I'm, I'm telling somebody what I'm gonna be writing about a year from now. And I know right now, I'm not gonna be writing about what I'm talking about in my application when I do my sabbatical. And so my application was about like rewriting the American catalog of poems. And what I actually wrote about was space and mermaids. So the, the process is completely different. And so here, instead of a uh, Jory Graham, you know, poem that ends with something that's unfinished, we start with the unfinished product and then we see the finished products at the end and they're completely different. And it also goes back to what um, somebody was saying about, you know, letting it speak for itself and what, what you think it's about and then what it used to be about. And here we haven't mentioned orange and it's called oranges and we crossed out sardines and it's called sardines. And this is an actual painting that, that you can see. Um, it is somewhere, somewhere on, somewhere on the interweb. You will find it. Okay. Um, and I know, is there a painting of dancers, modernist, contemporary modern life? Um, um, I'm not sure who's asking that. Um, the painting of the dancers, I'm not sure what, what that time period is. Yeah, I am not a, an art historian. Um, so if anybody knows, uh, was Brugel a, a modernist painter? I'm not sure what the time period of the painting is. But these are things that I could look up and I should probably know. Um, and oh, yes, Jordan, there's that old school, uh, old school versus new school. Jordan is saying that there are two different types of ekphrasis. And yes, yes, there are. Um, oh, great. Bye, Valerie. Thank you so much for, for joining us. Yeah, yeah, we're just about winding down anyway. So, but thank you, Valerie. Yes, um, I'm glad that you enjoyed it. Um, okay, so does anybody, if anybody has any comments about the, the O'Hara poem as well, um, or any questions about uh, New York school poetry, you can let me know, because that is, uh, that's one of the things that I really like about poetry, that, that, uh, the New York school. Um, Okay, so then I'm going to stop sharing so we don't have to keep staring at my screen. And hi, everybody. Hello. So, um, any other? Oh, Tony was here. Hi, Tony. <laughs> I didn't see everybody and everybody's saying goodbye. So, um, so we can wrap it up. So, um, any final thoughts uh, or you all have your, your homework to do. I gave you an assignment. So, if there are any other final thoughts, you can let me know. I'm looking at everybody now. I'm, I know I'm highlighted, but I'm looking at all of you. Um, yeah, great. Oh, somebody tuned in from the UK. Oh, that's awesome. So happy that you could join. I have no, no idea what time it is there, but because that's numbers and that's not me. Oh, I'm glad that you enjoyed it, everybody. Yeah. So. All right. So, well, I want to thank you all for coming. Um, and please, if you can, donate to Walt Whitman. It's a place near and dear to my heart. But uh, thank you all so much for coming. 
This is my last virtual presentation for a while because staring at a screen and talking to people is wearing on me uh, because my semester just ended too. So I'm going to be taking a break. So I'm really, really happy that you all were able to join me. Um, this is really my joy and my passion. And then I do look forward to coming back again and, and uh, doing this and then also seeing people in person and in parks or when we are allowed to meet inside again. Um, or even on the street just passing by and waving. It will be lovely to see all of you uh, at some point in time, but thank you. And thank you, Caitlin. You've been doing such an amazing job for the birthplace and really it's an unbelievable how people have come together in this time just to, to keep doing what we're doing. And it's been fabulous. So thank you so much. And um, everybody, I hope you all have a good night. Yeah. Thank you so much, Christina. I just wanna come back really quick. And again, thank you, Christina. I mean, seriously, you started the ball rolling for us to have online events. We, we didn't know what to do with ourselves. Um, and I also want to say we are unfortunately still closed, the museum. Um, we're connected to parks department. And right now they don't want us to be open, even just the park part. We have like this beautiful lawn um, in the back of the birthplace. And we'd love to open it up for picnics and things like that. But we're gonna have to wait a little longer, it seems like, like another few weeks, and then we might be able to do that. And then you could take your pictures with the house in the background and our famous Walt Whitman sculpture. Um, he has the butterfly on his finger and he's holding it up. Um, so we can't wait for that at least to be our next step. Um, and then beyond that, how do we get people into these rooms and keep them at an appropriate distance? Um, those sorts of things we're still thinking about, but yeah, we miss everyone. I mean, <laughs> there's no other way to look at it. Um, I miss being on the site and talking about Whitman and just having Whitman all around. Um, it seems so strange still to be remote from that um, and not be around visitors who are excited or sharing their ideas or telling us Whitman stories we probably don't even know. You know, there's so many. Um, and we got a donation recently of this beautiful oil painting um, that was done by a scholar who was interested in Whitman and we're so excited to be having that. Uh, we're gonna be able to show that soon whenever we open again. Um, but, so thank you so much, Christina. And last but not least, I was just thinking it's Father's Day this weekend. So happy Father's Day to everyone, whatever that means for you, um, however you celebrate. <laughs> I hope that you have a great one. Um, I post all the links in the chat if you wanna check them out. You wanna become a member, um, donate or even just to look up our upcoming events you can do that uh oh and i was talking about the we have this beautiful poetry circle that we want you to come visit whenever we are able to open up and um right now we're thinking about making the bricks and taking brick orders that go into that poetry circle and you can customize those bricks for with three lines um it can be poetry it can be for a special person anything you want um, it could be a Whitman line that's really special to you. There's a few of those out there that are really nice. Um, so check out those links, maybe copy paste them before you go and have an amazing week and two events next week. I hope to see you all there <laughs> and keep up to date with us. And of course, always email me if you have any questions, events at waltwhitman.org, events, plural. All right. Have a great week, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Christina. Bye. Thank you. Thank you so much. Take care. Bye. Bye.